As you likely know, humans have been eating meat for the better part of 2 million years, but a lot of people are still scared and think or have the perception that if they have red meat, they will get colon cancer, they will have all these health-related issues, clogged arteries from the saturated fat, but I wanna share with you an article that I think might help clear up some of the controversy. This is from David Clearfield, who is a researcher for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, what I like about this article, titled Research Gaps in Evaluating the Relationship of Meat and Health, is he talks about a lot of the limitations in the epidemiological studies. And as many of you know, and I just wanted to share this with you, um, I would encourage you, if you have the interest, to download this article, which I will link in the show notes and the description of this YouTube video, as well as the iTunes podcast below. But he talks about a lot of the issues with nutrition epidemiology because it turns out that these studies are not powered and set up to look at the direction of causality, suggesting that there is a lot of bias and limitations in the data because many epidemiological studies rely upon self-reported food frequency questionnaires. And many of these questionnaires are inherently inaccurate. Like, for example, how many servings of pineapple have you had in the last month? How many hot dogs have you had in the last two weeks? How many servings of red meat have you had? It's really hard for people to look and hard for epidemiologists, as he talks about in this, to quantify the effect of this exposure. Whether that ex And that exposure is really simple in the context of alcohol or smoking. If someone were to survey me, how many cigarettes have you had in the last year? It would be zero. Very easy to do. But when they, if I were to be asked, how many servings of mango have I had in the last year? I, I couldn't honestly tell you. Maybe it's 10, 15, 3. I, I have no idea. And that gets really, really uh, hard to make any strong associations in terms of the direction of causality because he highlights multiple studies. There's the nurse's health study, as many of you know, uh, and how individuals change their diet over time. So even some of these follow-up studies where there is an intervention or people are uh, tracked over time, oftentimes people change their diets. You know, they have higher fiber diets uh, for a month or two or a year and low fiber diets. Maybe they go keto and paleo and then carnivore and back. And, you know, a lot of people change their diets over time. So we, we don't really have good data on the fact. And again, these studies like to highlight the fact that Red meat is the driving factor for all these uh, chronic conditions and so forth. But he highlights in the study that domestication of cattle occurred 8, 000, over 8,000 years ago. So as I mentioned, numerous studies, I remember anthropo anthropology class and so forth uh, in college, you know, we, we talked about how humans, our brains got bigger because we developed tools to eat uh, animals and and consume red meat and the the micronutrients and macronutrients and so forth in the meat carnitine taurine zinc b12 all these things are not found uh, in in most plant products that enhanced the size and the cognition of ancestral humans and then we started to domesticate cattle around 8,000 years ago so we've been having red meat for a long period of time but as you can see from this image here this was a recently published study looking at USDA statistics we are having less and less red meat in compared to years past. We're having a lot more poultry and other sources of protein, but not red meat. And yet we still see these studies that come out and say that red meat consumption is really problematic. It's linked with colon cancer. I have friends of friends who often reach out to me saying, you know, hey, look, I've been told that I should go on a plant-based diet because it will lower my cholesterol and it will not raise my risk of having cancer. And you're promoting or advocating for all the different you know, nutrients, conditionally essential nutrients, taurine, creatine, uh, zinc, and so forth uh, in red meat that's not found in plants. Well, people are confused by this and they don't often realize that most of the studies uh, that these policymakers and consensus statement papers uh, talk about are using data from food frequency questionnaires. And these are inherently inaccurate. And now he highlights a paper by Nichols et al. in 2015. He says the authors who are epidemiologists concluded by writing that all traditional dietary analysis in epidemiology share one strong but incorrect assumption that exposures such as foods or nutrients were measured with great accuracy. So as I mentioned, you might hear data from the NHANES follow-up study, the nurse's health study, the health professional's follow-up study that found that red meat is linked with increased risk of cancer, all-cause mortality, heart disease-specific mortality. These food frequency questionnaires are inherently inaccurate. They're an imprecise measure. And another aspect that David brings up here is these epidemiological nutrition studies don't have a pre-specified hypothesis, meaning they just run the numbers and oftentimes these false positives can occur in the data. 
and they are not statistically powered to account for all of the confounding variables that might lead to false positives in the research. So I think that's really important that we understand that epidemiology, especially as it's related to nutrition, is inherently inaccurate. So when people start to talk to you about, well, red meat is linked with cancer. Well, if you uh, don't eat enough fiber, all these bad things are going to happen. Uh, many of these epidemiological studies um, are relying upon measurements that are not so accurate. And that's why we do need randomized control trials, but it really is hard to conduct randomized control trials. So where does that leave us? I like to look at people on the internet, influencers, uh, people who are eating a certain way and just see how they look over time. Is this individual, do they reflect a healthy body composition, look at their blood work, see how their mental health uh, is going over time, their hair loss or uh, uh, various aging, uh, objective biomarkers of aging. Start to look at these proxies over time, their fitness uh, parameters, are they increasing or decreasing, body composition, all these things are proxies to see if a way of eating is promoting health. And I think this is where getting a little bit personalized here. We can all eat a certain way for a short period of time and it won't necessarily acutely affect our long-term health. But when we start to see uh, you know, people age over time, and there's been many influencers over the years. And so um, there was a Dr. John McDougall who recently passed away, who was a, a real big proponent of a high starch diet. Towards the end of his life, it was pretty obvious that he was suffering from cognitive decline. There was an interview with John Duyard, who is a promoted of a vegetarian diet, but acknowledges in this interview, and I can cut to that clip, that some people just don't do well on a, on a vegetarian diet. And McDougall uh, was adamant that he's never seen a single person that didn't do well on a vegan diet. Here's that clip. I could go on and on and on and on. If you, you, you say they have their research on their site and they're articulate, fine. Put them on video. Don't well, look at their words. Don't listen to their words. Let's see what they look like. They look like they're dying because of what they believe in eat. So as you can see here, nutrition is very personalized. And this is why I implore many of you to try on different diets and see what works for you. I think most of the evidence suggests that we should be eating an omnivorous style diet. Eat fruits, vegetables that agree with you. If you can eat grains and not gain body weight and have good metabolic health and a healthy body composition, then so be it. But I think most healthy omnivorous diets are protein forward and enriched in whole real foods in a diverse array, olives, fermented foods, different vegetables and fruits, again, that agree with you and your gut health and foster healthy digestion. So as David talks about here, there is a lot of bias that can occur in epidemiological studies. So going forward, when you're presented with a new article or there's a, a mainstream uh, media article about how red meat is bad or this food is great or, or uh, there was something about sweeteners recently, most of these are epidemiological studies that, as he talks about here by Hill et al., uh, as well as uh, Nicholas et al., epidemiology doesn't have really good, accurate measurements. We cannot rely upon food frequency questionnaires. So I just wanted to share this with you. Hopefully you have access uh, to this paper, a really good review, so that you can have these tools at your fingertips when your health professional or someone that you work with or someone in your family is saying, hey, I know you've lost weight. I know you've improved your blood work. You're getting stronger, you're getting more fit, but the foods you're eating are really, really bad. You can say, hey, look, uh, the way that the so-called experts and pundits are saying these foods are bad is they're relying upon inherently inaccurate food frequency questionnaires. So I wanted you to understand some of the limitations of this way of analyzing the data. Hopefully you found this video helpful and because exercise is really important, just wanted to have this parting words of advice. If you are exercising and you're not taking creatine, you're really missing out on an easy way to enhance your workouts and your exercise performance. You can save on the creatine enhanced electrolyte sticks by Myoscience. This is a phenomenal intra or pre-workout. There's close to 900 reviews from people just like you who take this around exercise and get great benefits. You can check that out over at myoscience.com and save with the code podcast at checkout. We'll catch you on a future video down the road.